So yeah, welcome to this evening's webinar. Many thanks for joining. Um, my name is James Burker. I work for um, for Dork, and um, I'm pleased to say that we're, we're delighted to, to have organized this uh, webinar this evening dedicated to the topic of um, VR buckling. Um, sometimes a kind of unloved art, um, but a, a vital tool for VR surgeons. And I think um, this evening session will be an excellent practical overview of buckling um, for, for anyone who wants to learn more about the technique um, and also who wants to refine some of the skills they already have. So um, this evening's webinar, we would really encourage you to, to engage with the, with the presenters, to ask questions during the session. Uh, there's a, a chat box which runs through Zoom, uh, which I'd encourage you to use to, uh, to pose your questions. And we'll try and deal with those questions as we go through the session. Um, everyone joining will be on mute and um, their video will be uh, disabled as well. So um, we prefer if you keep your questions to the chat, that means we can, we can track those and handle them as we go through the meeting. Um, other than that, um, basically we just um, hope you enjoy this evening session. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce our three speakers, uh, Gurab Shah, who's gonna be moderating today's session, uh, Mike Jumper and Dean Elliott. Um, and without further delay, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Gaurav and um, over to you for the session. It's great. Uh, thanks, James, for the kind words. Before I put my screen up, uh, I want to thank uh, you uh, and Dork for allowing us to do this. Obviously, uh, I really didn't think about it, but this is really buckles coast to coast, uh, East Coast, Midwest, and uh, West Coast. So this is really spans the entire country. And Mike and uh, Dean, uh, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, uh, I think you'll get a lot of uh, hopefully practical things that uh, we have all learned uh, just in terms for uh, uh, where, where we uh, do things. So before that, uh, I'll sort of just get started, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go from there, okay? Uh, so hope you guys can all see my slides, James. Uh, I think the screen's probably just coming up. We can't see them yet. Let me try to, uh, let's see here, share screen. It should come up now. How about now? Oh, there we go, perfect. Oh. All right, great. Uh, so uh, again, thanks and uh, welcome uh, to this session. Uh, thanks to, to James and uh, Mike and Dean. And I think we're gonna talk about buckles, uh, sort of labeled as, as dying art or art nouveau. And uh, th there's a lot to be said about buckles and what we wanna do. Um, so next slide. So again, it's just not me saying a lost art, but uh, sometimes people feel there is a lost art. This is a beautiful book by Steve Russell from years of Iowa uh, that uh, shows us these drawings. And for a lot of the fellows, these used to be our wide angle drawings. So this is Optos, but uh, in a drawing format or Zeiss. So uh, this is sort of post operatively shows where a buckle was placed. And I'm sure Dean and Mike uh, can probably remember uh, these things that we used to do. And our fellows don't do this anymore. Uh, and that there is an art to examination for buckles. So we're gonna talk a lot about uh, the options for retinal attachment repair, but we're gonna talk about buckles. There's other options that work well, and we do all these other options, all three of us. We do a lot of vitrectomy surgery. And I think, in my opinion, people who do a lot of vitrectomies also appreciate the value of buckles uh, because we all, uh, it's not a one size fits approach. And this is gonna be by our own experience and training. So uh, this is a beautiful slide of Dean that shows a giant retinal tear. We're not gonna talk about this. Okay, that's a whole different talk. But we're gonna talk about cases like this, a retinal dialysis, uh, superior bullous detachment, superior shallow detachment with a PVD, inferior shallow detachment, superior shallow without a PVD, subretinal bands with retinal detachment. Here's a chronic detachment of a patient of mine who underwent buckle. Uh, here's the uh, uh, infrared photograph shows the break and here's the post buckle picture, patient with a PVD. Here's another patient. So here's a case for you, Mike, that you were kind of to share with us, 25-year-old gentleman with an inferior dialysis with a retinal detachment. What, what do you sort of, for the fellows, you know, what, what decisions have you already kind of made after you've seen this patient in the office? So, you know, one of the things that we talk about with the fellows is, you know, where is the, where is the vitreous attached and where is it detached in this sort of setting? And the vitreous is attached to the 
posterior edge of this brake, as opposed to in a giant tear case or a horseshoe tear case, the tear, the vitreous is attached to the anterior flap. And so, you know, most of the time when you have a dialysis, uh, a buckle is a much easier surgery to do because your uh, the vitreous is attached. And, uh, you know, the one challenge for buckles like this are that sometimes the, the buckle has to be put pretty anterior where the aura serrata is. Uh, the other thing that is a consideration is this subretinal band, and it's really gotten to be, it gets to be an art as to know, you know, which subretinal bands are going to cause problems and which are not. And, you know, just looking at this, I think all of us on this panel would say, yes, this is one of those bands that's going to be easily buckled and not be a big issue. And you can buckle this case. And this is probably the easiest procedure to do on a patient like this. So, so, so Dean, let me go to you. Uh, when you see a patient like this in the office, have you already kind of thought about where I'm going to put a buckle, what kind of buckle I'm going to put, where I'm going to drain? I mean, do all those things, I mean, with experience, the three of us already sort of know that, but did you, when you first started out, did you already kind of think about all that when you're in the office seeing a patient like this? Well, we were taught years ago to do drawings, as you mentioned, and to plan all that ahead of time. So yes, you have to think about uh, whether or not you're going to drain fluid. If so, where? and what type of band you're gonna put on around the eye. In this case, I would like to point something out. You see it better in the drawing than you do in the photograph, but you see the pigment clumps. Okay, so that's grade A PVR. And you see the best pigment clumps on cases of retinal dialysis. And there's a few reasons. One, uh, Mike said the vitreous is pretty much attached to that posterior flap. So you don't have a lot of sinuresis or movement of the vitreous. So these clumps just kind of accumulate inferiorly and they hang out there. Two, these retinal detachments are usually chronic and therefore there's a lot of time uh, for the RPE to come loose and float around. And three, the brakes are usually pretty big like you see here. So anytime you want a nice example of clumps, look at an inferior vitreous of a dialysis patient. So I, I put the buckle in, the, in a similar place in all of these. That's not a lot of uh, decision-making there. But in terms of where I'm going to drain and if I'm going to drain, there is some decision-making there. So I think, Dean, that's an important point because when fellows say, okay, this patient signed up for a buckle and it's just a buckle, you, the three of us have already kind of thought about how we're going to do it, where we're going to drain, and what kind of you know, uh, element we're going to use. So I think that's an important point that you, again, as Dean has said, there has to be pre-planning just like anything uh, for what you do. So Mike, here, here, here's a case that we often see, 49-year-old patient uh, goes to Walmart for glasses, is 2020 and has this problem. And I think if you ever want to challenge your buckle skills, this is the kind of patient that we see more and more as more wide angle viewing, as uh, wide angle systems have become available in optometrist offices in, in the community. So Dean, how would you sort of, well, what do you look at a patient like this? 2020, and you got to convince this patient they got to have surgery. Well, what, what do you look at a buckle in, in a patient like this? Or what are your options? Well, it helps a lot if the patient is symptomatic. Sometimes they're actually not symptomatic. As you know, they come in 2020 and somebody noticed a detachment and referred them in, then it's a harder conversation. Even if they're not symptomatic, sometimes you can show them that they have a field defect. You can cover their other eye and have them wave their hand and realize that there's a corresponding field defect to the area of detachment. When you demonstrate that to the patient, they're a little more likely to say, okay, I do have a problem. I need something done before my macula comes off and you could teach them what that means. So for this case, uh, you know, does the patient have a PVD? That's one thing I'd like to know. If there's no PVD, which there may not be because it's a chronic detachment and hasn't progressed fast, uh, this is one of the cases that I'd like to do a buckle. Uh, I really like buckles if it's chronic, if it's uh, inferior. Uh, so this, this would be a perfect case. And uh, you have a nice drawing. I'm assuming there's one hole in the lattice and nothing else, correct? Yeah, correct. So what's your question? What, what buckle am I going to place? Uh, no, just, just so, so go, just go to the pre-op. Uh, you, you mentioned PVD or no PVD. So Mike, let's say this is a 49-year-old fake retina doc. He has a partial PVD, right? Because sometimes when people say, well, do they have a PVD? Maybe sometimes the vitreous is not fully detached in the periphery. 
and, and we all cut it, although we do vitrectomy in these patients. What, what does that make a huge difference for you in this person, 49, if they have a PVD or no PVD? Not, not really, because when you see a small hole in lattice and there's a, a fairly large detachment associated with it, that is, like Dean said, happened over quite a period of time. That fluid underneath the retina is extremely thick. And, uh, you know, and, and so uh, I think that this is one of those cases and you see the subretinal fibrosis, which also kind of indicates chronicity. And it seems to me like the way to treat this would, would be with a buckle and uh, if it was my retina and I, I had it, I would, I would want a buckle uh, put on so that um, I wasn't having to deal with uh, having my vitreous removed, having the progression of cataract, which in a 49 year old, it's sort of, you're on the fence as to whether, you know, you're gonna have fairly rapid development of cataract or not uh, by doing a vitrectomy. And, uh, you know, to me, this is one of those cases where a uh, buckle uh, alone with the drainage would be the way to go. Yeah, Mike, and, and, and I think that, that's very important because I, I, I see sometimes cases like this that either done primary vitrectomy or buckle vit. And, and it's okay. I think you should do whatever surgery that works best in your hands. But to me, in a 49, whether it's PVD or no PVD, I... I I would typically, for me personally, a buckle, I'd have one of you guys do it if it was me. So uh, so here's a patient, Mike, that you sent, a 42-year-old phacic myope with a detachment. Now you've got multiple breaks and a detachment. H how do you kind of think about this case and what you would do? This well, in a, yeah, for me, I mean, in our practice here, um, the two options I think would be a pneumatic, which I think would be the first choice in this case, even though there's uh, a, a break that's far nasal, you know, if you, if you do a pneumatic in this case and you um, position them for the lowest break, uh, which would be on his, uh, the person's uh, right side, I think that you're going to be, uh, do have a pretty good chance of success with treating this case. Uh, but, you know, the, the alternative, and we have a lot of this is patients who uh, you need to travel, they uh, have to drive uh, over mountain passes and things like that. And for that, for those patients, then uh, buckles, you know, becomes the first choice. But I think the two options in this case in a fake patient for me would be either a pneumatic or a buckle. So I, I saw Dean wince. All right, Dean. So, so to tell me what you would do. Well, I'm not sure I winced, but um, <laughs> I, I like to do pneumatics when a pneumatic is a slam dunk. In other words, like a small area of detachment, maybe one quadrant superior, one break, maybe two if they're next to each other. And the thing I don't like about this is the lattice down below. Uh, I'm assuming there's a PVD because I only do pneumatics in cases that have PVDs and the other features that I mentioned. So I don't like inferior pathology. Could a pneumatic work and probably would it work? Yes, but I really reserve them for the ones that I think have the absolute highest potential. So, so, so Dean, let's say you were to do a buckle, um, do, do you, uh, I, I know there are some people who would say, well, maybe I'll just do a segmental buckle and cryo those areas because I'm worried about the refractive issues in a 42 year old. And we're going to talk about segmental buckles and, and so on and so forth. But what are your guys' feelings towards segmental buckles? I, I, I haven't really, for me, I'll give you my opinion, but I'd like to hear Dean and uh, Mike, your opinion on segmental buckles. So I'm not a big fan of segmental buckles. You're already there. It's not much more work to encircle the globe. And I do worry about other areas of pathology, especially here when you have two other areas of lattice. And if the PVD is not complete, they're going to get a PVD at some point and they could pull a tear and they're more likely to detach if, if they pull a tear in an area without a buckle. They're less likely to get a tear uh, and detach if if that happens, if there's traction in an area where there's a buckle. And I have seen several people, you know, not a ton, but I've seen several over the years that have had segmental buckles done elsewhere, because as I said, I really don't do them, uh, who've detached in other quadrants. Uh, so I, I, I would prefer to encircle people when I'm gonna do a buckle. Michael, you're a segmental or, or, or a circumferential guy? Oh, I, I almost routinely do uh, circumferential buckles. Uh, and I think that, you know, 
for a pneumatic, I would guess, you know, you're talking about percentages. I would guess that the, the chance of a success with the pneumatic is in the order of 70 to 80 percent in this kind of case. Uh, a buckle is 90 to 95 percent if you're doing an encircling buckle. And I think if you do a segmental buckle, it's somewhere between the two. And so you just, uh, I don't think it's as successful as a as an encircling buckle. You're not supporting the other the other areas of thinning and potential breaks in the eye. The times that I've used segmental buckles, and I'll use a, a circumferential sponge at times uh, in patients that say have an inferior detachment and uh, say a superior bleb, and I don't wanna violate the conjunctiva up superiorly. There's a case that I'm gonna show later in which a patient had uh, uh, a inferior pathology and they had a complication from an encircling band and I didn't uh, I, I didn't want to mess with the the superior muscles that had uh, had a problem so okay I mean I'll give you my opinion I, I I don't do just a nasal vitrectomy and a detachment so I don't do segmental buckles I I, I just think if you're going to do vitrectomy a complete vitrectomy uh, I'd rather just do a complete buckle I'm like Dean and you guys I, I I'm a circumferential guy uh, so here's a patient, a fake RD, uh, multiple breaks uh, with a PVD. This patient was buckled. Um, th this brings up a couple of issues. Uh, we'll talk about this, but you know this is a fairly bullous detachment, right? So there's some uh, challenges in terms for uh, treating this for the buckle, just like vitrectomy. Uh, Dean, you see a patient like this, um, and then Mike, uh, do you? Uh, you know, would, would, would you buckle this patient, Dean? So I would probably do a vitrectomy. You know, years ago, we buckled just about everything, as both of you guys know. So certainly a buckle is reasonable. The one thing I don't like about buckle in this case is you do have to drain fluid. Uh, I mean, you don't have to, but my preference for draining is three things. If it's a bullous, if it's chronic, or if it's inferior. So this one qualifies as being bullous. You don't absolutely positively have to drain fluid. You could do a buckle and either do nothing else or inject the gas bubble. Um, but I don't like uh, draining fluid if I don't have to. So I would probably do a vitrectomy on this and I would, you know, he's got a PVD at superior breaks, the gas bubble is gonna tampon out nicely. I fully acknowledge the patient's gonna get a cataract, but I'd probably lean towards that, but a buckle is also fine. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. We're going to move on. There, there'll be a lot well, I've more. got a couple, hey, a couple of things, okay. Garav. Going back, there's a couple of questions from the audience we wanted to hit. And it goes back to the dialysis case. Um, and uh, one question has to do with, uh, do you place a band at the base posterior to the equator every time? Or do you change the band position based on where the dialysis is? And so, and then what buckle would you use if you were to uh, place a band for uh, dialysis? Uh, Dean, why don't you go real quick first and then I'll, I'll, I'll make our comments. So when I do dialysis, I almost always use a 42 band, which is four millimeters. Uh, and I do drain fluid because they're usually chronic. Mike, what about you? Yeah, I, I mean, I mark, I mark breaks and I try to, uh, I, and, and what I was saying before is, you know, I'm always somewhat surprised at how anterior the dialysis is yeah. compared to most horseshoe tears that you see. And so uh, I really try to mark the break and I want to support the, you know, the break with the, with the buckle. And so, you know, when, when I'm doing a buckle vit, you know, I basic, basically place the buckle around the eye uh, and look to support the greatest circumference. You know, you can kind of see where the greatest circumference is. It's usually, you know, you're putting your anterior suture a couple millimeters behind the muscle insertion. But for uh, uh, these breaks uh, that we're seeing here in the dialysis, I mean, I mark them. And I think that that's part of this art is that you gotta be pretty good at being able to mark breaks and be able to localize them so that you can know where your buckle is. Now, most of the time, you know, a 42, a 40, 50 band, or, you know, any three to five millimeter band is gonna kind of be able to support the area of the breaks that you're dealing with. And, and that's what you, you need to do. But um, every once in a while in these dialysis patients, if I feel like after I put the buckle on and I've looked and I, I'm pretty much up at the muscle insertion and there's still a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit more, uh, I need to come a little anterior. You can sometimes put a little element like these 117 elements or something like that to get a little more dent in that area, but that's very uncommon. So I personally kind of do a uh, similar, not the same. I typically use a 277 tire and a 40 band uh, as uh, my buckles are a 40, 50 band. So depending on the pathology and the orbit. 
All right, so Dean, this is a case of yours, somebody who has a young patient where we might talked about these subretinal bands with a detachment. And sometimes we go to meetings and we see beautiful videos of bands being taken out and the complications that causes. And you know, people say great case and all that stuff. But, but the question being is, is, is there bands that, I mean, does that sort of negate doing buckles on patients with bands? What, what's your sort of feeling on that? No, so what's interesting about this case is this guy was an airline pilot and he had 20-20 vision with a fovea on detachment with this anatomy and he had you know breaks in all quadrants. So the presence of subretinal bands should not necessarily alarm you. You have to look at their appearance. So here you see sort of straight bands they don't look like they're exerting a massive amount of traction. They're not contracted where you see a star fold emanating. You know, star folds obviously are usually from pre-retinal membranes, but sometimes subretinal membranes contract and, and give you the wrinkled retina like a star fold. You don't see that. And when the band is straight and not contracted, sometimes just repairing the detachment overcomes the forces that the band is exerting. So if you do pediatric retina and you buckle kids with detachments, it's very common to have pretty extensive bands flatten out nicely with just a buckle. And even though this was an adult, I elected just to buckle this gentleman, uh, despite the presence of the subretinal bands. Uh, the, my... other, the, other thing with, the other thing with that is that, you know, even if there are bands and you're not really sure, if you buckle them, close the break, get the retina anterior to the, the bands attached, then you'll kind of know how much effect the bands are going to have. And then if you have to do a vitrectomy, it's a whole lot easier to do it in an attached or, you know, tractionally detached retina than a bullously regmatogenous detachment. So, you know, I, I don't think that it precludes you from being able to do a vitrectomy later if, you know, you're, if you're on the fence as to whether the band is bad enough or not. But I just think that Dean's right. Most of the time, the kind of bands you see here are not going to be those that keep the retina detached after a good buckle. All right, so I have nothing more to add, so we're going to move on. I agree 100%. Hey, I've got one more, uh, one more question about these bullous detachments that came from the audience, and it has to do with uh, how often in what circumstances uh, would you place gas with a straight buckle and what type of gas? So I can answer this, you know, uh, th like that bullous detachment that we saw, and Dean had commented on it, that that might be something uh, buckle vits uh, good for. I, I uh, when I'm talking to the fellows, that's oftentimes the, the what they say is, you know, it's a very bullish detachment. But I, I do think that there's a, 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 if you can localize the break, sometimes you can see you can't see the breaks when it's very bullishly detached and there's lots of folds and everything. But if you can feel pretty confident that you can see the breaks and you can treat them, then those are the cases that I'll sometimes consider putting an air bubble in uh, as after I've drained the eye, because a lot of times the, the eye is pretty soft after the drainage procedure and I'll, I'll inject air at the end of the case. It's very rare for me in the OR to inject anything more than air in a, in a buckle case. I don't know how you two feel. So Mike, I, I, anytime I drain, I have two syringes ready, one with air and one with little pure SF6. So it depends on what volume and what I can get in the eye. So I, just keep, I typically use only those. Uh, but we're gonna get to that because I'm gonna show you cases of, of a bullish detachment, but good question. Got it. So, so Dean, this is your patient, beautiful subretinal bands you show, show um, and here's uh, the drainage site. We're going to talk about this as well, a little bit of uh, hemorrhage of the drainage site, but lo and behold, 2020 and still flying, uh, I guess still flying, unless he's out of a job these days, but uh, I guess still flying. Uh, he's a, a private pilot for rich people, so he's yeah, still but, flying. Yeah, well, maybe that's Mike's pilot, I'm not sure. All he's right, even so, better. So this is what we were talking about, Michael, and... and you know, when you have a bullous detachment patient like this, so this is a patient of mine, had multiple breaks, and it's for the fellows, it's always hard for them to figure out how to cryo in these patients. And there is a procedure I haven't done, the DACE procedure where you drain and then you put air in uh, and then you cryo and then put the, uh, you know, the uh, buckle on. I, I, I don't do that. Uh, I, I've just uh, been doing it where I think if you go anterior to posterior on these patients, you can get cryo. Uh, but Mike, you have, first of all, you have any uh, things for the fellows? How do you cry on these patients uh, with bullous detachments? Yeah, you know, I think if you go kind of slow in the OR and you, uh, because basically, you know, sometimes if the IOP is fairly normal at the beginning, it's hard to indent well. But, you know, if you kind of 
massage around and you uh, take your time and you're examining and then trying to cryo, you can oftentimes get the uh, get the eye the apposition happening and you can get good cryo. And just like you said, going anterior to posterior, you can get a like for instance in this supero nasal break, this flap tear that's just supero nasal next to that fold. Uh, if you if you cryo the the anterior part of that retina and then kind of cryo down to the flap, then you probably can get to the the whole thing. And you know, I think most of the time uh, you can you can cryo these. And then uh, you know, there's also times where if you really have to buckle for some reason, you can you know consider uh, doing treatment on the buckle after the after the fact. But I don't like doing that. I like to have it all treated at the time of the OR. But you know, there's sometimes when you, if you get it reattached and you feel like you've got a break that maybe not supported and there's a little traction yet, you could put some laser on around it. Okay. I, I have some other stuff for Dean. I know Dean is itching, but I, I got some more stuff for Dean. So here, here's a uh, similar patient like this, Dean, again. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that I see for fellows when they see a patient like this, fake ache with a bullous detachment, they just say, okay, buckle it, right? Like they, they, it's kind of this, this, this feeling that they get. But this patient was also buckled and did well. And same thing, Mike, had uh, uh, three breaks and we buckled this guy. And he is actually an accountant and he's done well with a PVD. So, so you know, I got a question for you. Uh, this is from the audience, but would you ever do um, an AC tap or something to lower the I IOP more rapidly to try to be able to oppose the, the choroid to the, when you're doing a, a cryo? Has anybody, have you either done that? I have not, and I, I, I have, I have not needed the needed it, but I have not. Dean, what about you? I have not, but I, I do what Mike said. If you do it slowly, and you, you know, you're first of all, you're marking the brakes carefully, uh, which which takes some time, and you're pressing on the eye, and then you take the cryoprobe after you've identified where the brakes are and mark them. And usually, the eye's a little bit softer at that point because you've been pressing for a while. So yep. I have not had to do an AC in order to soften the eye more. Okay. So, so these are all the things that all of us kind of take into consideration, age, lens status, hyloid. Uh, so if you had to kind of make your judgment and Dean on Mike on this list, what are the two, two or three things that really says, you know what, this patient needs a buckle? Dean? Well, hyloid status for me is one of the most important. I, okay. I love doing buckles in young myopes with an attached hyloid. They don't have to be myopic, but they usually are. And as we mentioned, usually they're low-lying detachments. Usually they're somewhat chronic. They have lattice, round holes. Uh, that would be my biggest reason to do a buckle. I guess you don't have dialysis here. D dialysis is another big reason to do buckle for me. So that would be my major thing. Mike, what about you? Let's say you have a 50-year-old with a PVD, fake it. And does that preclude you from doing a buckle or say, okay, maybe this person I'll do a vitrectomy or vit buckle? No, you know, and I also, I mean, I include the patient a lot of times in these decisions because, uh, you know, I, I think that um, some 50 year olds uh, are, you know, they're, it'll, it'll be in a different sort of decision tree, but the, the status of the highway, the lens and where their brakes are located really do matter to me a lot. And so I, I think that those are the, the big three here. And then if there is enough PVR that I think is gonna make the, the, the ability to get the retina reattached with a buckle alone, I certainly, that, that's a con big consideration as well. But I, I try to include the patient in the decision. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it has to do with uh, their ability to be mobile pretty soon after the surgery. If they have a buckle and they, you know, need to travel in a, three weeks or so, uh, that 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 can be a you know a big consideration for the patient. Sure, I just want to add I do a similar thing as these uh, these folks. Uh, again, I do pay a lot uh, of attention to the lens. If they're fake, yeah, I really try to do whether PVD or no PVD. If I can buckle that eye, I will buckle that eye uh, if possible because we see a lot of 50, 55 year olds fake detachments, and uh, they might have a partial PVD. And I found that in, at the time of vitrectomy, if you do them, those are difficult hyaloids in the periphery to remove uh, in those patients. So, um, so you know, we, all three of us thinks buckles are great uh, and, and valuable, but I think I've seen this and we've seen this declining uh, buckling because I think there's really a, a lack of confidence in indirect skills for a lot of the fellows and trainings. 
I think that uh, unfortunately we can't wear the biome in the office. Uh, we still have to look uh, with the indirect. And uh, these are some of the factors that I think there's been a decline. And uh, Mike, you, you think, are there other factors that I'm not listed here that, that you think there's a decline in buckling? Well, I just think the teaching of a scleral buckle is a lot different than teaching a vitrectomy where both people can be at the scope and seeing the same thing at the same time. Uh, even the best, you know, indirects with the teaching heads and all that, they're just not quite the same. And uh, I think that that's a huge part of it. I think using a microscope and using a, a, a light, uh, a chandelier light when doing buckles can, I think, be a very good teaching tool. And that to me is something that, you know, we try to incorporate uh, with the fellows, but I do think that you know, just being able to teach it and feel comfortable teaching it. And, uh, you know, there are a, are a couple of blind parts of a, of a buckle that you just don't have with a vitrectomy, something that only the person doing it can see. For instance, this, the drainage procedure, the way we do it is a needle drainage, and that's not easy to see and teach and do uh, with another person unless you're using a chandelier. Uh, and, and, and again, we don't want to blame the fellows because the fellows will only learn from us. Right, so it, it's it's really it, Mike the people training the fellows. I mean, the fellows want to learn. Uh, so, Dean, what about you? You know, we all three of us learned it. Uh, but what 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 do you think? Besides, are there any other reasons I've missed here? Well, Mike makes good points. I think buckles are a little less forgiving, so there's less room for error. You don't support the brake properly, or you put the buckle too high or too low or whatever, and you know it's probably not going to work. Whereas with vitrectomy. As Mike said, you can see everything, That's, that helps, but there are less nuances in vitrectomy. It's a little more straightforward. Hence the art, <laughs> hence the art, Dean. All right, so these are some of the things that I'm sure you guys have heard fellows you know, talk about, uh, maybe uh, discuss, they want all the fluid to be gone. And I wanna talk about this. I think the drainage part is what scares them. When to drain, what to drain with, and how do you follow fluid post buckle? So we're going to talk about all this, but these are some of the things that I hear uh, uh, from fellows, and I'm sure you guys hear the same as well. So obviously, you know, cost is certainly an, uh, an issue. You know, it's about 105 bucks, and this is 600 is really for the cheap. Uh, that's the Midwestern vitrectomy. I'm sure then the, the West and East Coast is probably more expensive uh, for vitrectomy, but this is just a, a, a great paper uh, from Stewart uh, from San Francisco actually looked at this. So, you know, you decide to do a buckle. What about anesthesia, uh, Michael? What, what do you use? Uh, general, local, LMA, what, what do you use? Um, I'll t I tend to do general anesthesia for buckle cases, um, but I've done them under local MAC and, um, and then a lot of LMA uh, for people. But uh, as in general, uh, I tend to do it under general. And that's another, I think, consideration that people have is that if they're operating primarily at surgery centers, and uh, their surgery center is less likely to do general cases, then they're probably going to pr prefer to do a vitrect. I mean, a, yeah, a vitrectomy for a, a detachment than a than a buckle if that's how they were taught to do buckles under general. And that's how I typically do it. Dean, what about you? I do buckles under general these days. For years, I tried local, and many times patients were uncomfortable, and I've just given up doing it that way. I, I, I don't want someone feeling a lot of pain during my procedure. It's out of my control to some extent because it depends on the anesthesiologist and how much sedation they'll give. And some are very comfortable giving a lot of sedation and others aren't. And I just do general for all buckles these days. Very different than what I used to do. So I went the other way. I used to do general when I first started from Wills in here and I uh, switched to local. And this case uh, kind of uh, showed, uh, this not the same exact case, but this happened, a young uh, person who had a buckle bucked uh, after general anesthesia. And this is what happened. We saw him the next day, right? So you, you can see massive 360 degrees of choroidal hemorrhage. And I, I think whatever way you do local or general, you need to make sure the anesthesiologist can work with you. And this is something I call the don't poke the bear protocol that we've sort of come up with uh, our uh, anesthesiologist who, who I work with all the time. But the addition of ketamine has really made a difference in, in, in these cases. 
and it has decreased the use of uh, propofol uh, and has made patients much more comfortable. I give all these patients solumedrol, toradol, and they're much more comfortable afterwards, but ketamine has been a huge help along with this cocktail uh, that at least that we use uh, for local anesthesia. So we, we all kind of know the goals of buckles, uh, so I'm not gonna spend too much time. So, you know, we have these three basic elements, tires, sponges, and bands. Uh, so I'll start with you, uh, uh, Dean. You have a favorite, you know, a band or a tire that you like to use for your straight buckles? So as I mentioned earlier, I like 42 band for just about everything. If it's a high myope with lots of pathology and the pathology is extending more posteriorly, I use a 220 and a 240. Okay, Mike, what about you? Yeah, yes. I use either either a 42 band or a, a 40-50 uh, uh, band, the four millimeter or five millimeter, um, just in bands most every time. Okay, and so I I uh, I use similar. I use a 40-50 band or a 277 tire and a and a 40 band with it, uh, and tire in the area of uh, pathology. So these are all these products. There's products by Dork, products by Laptician. You guys, the fellows, have seen all these things. But we just told you that between the three of us, we have only about two or three of these things that we typically use. You know, you, you can look at all these wall charts. I remember looking at this as a resident thinking, boy, this is so confusing. And I, I looked at all these products, but there's really only two or three things that we typically tend to, tend to use. So this is kind of what our tray looks like for people who haven't seen a buckle tray. Maybe it's an unknown to some. Uh, Dean, besides, uh, uh, do you guys have anything special in your tray you keep in your buckles? Any special sutures besides 5 nylon or what, Mike? Uh, I'll go with you, Dean. Anything special? Nope, I think uh, you have it all there. You have the O'Connor scleral depressor because that's a little different than the regular, yeah, you do. That's right that's there. Little, so just keep in mind when you're using the O'Connor depressor, which is a little different than the typical one, right? The typical one has a little bulb on one side and a hammerhead on the other. Uh, the O'Connor has a bulb on one side and this round sharp thing on the other side. And when I was a fellow, I was actually watching a case and somebody caused an open globe with the Connor, with the O'Connor tip on a high myo. They were rolling it around and pushing kind of hard and it, it actually went through the thin sclera. So be real careful with that. I don't roll it around. I, I turn it sideways and move until I find the break and then I rotate it so that the circle is against the sclera. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about Mark. Yeah, and that's a really good point. For fellows who haven't seen it, but that's an O'Connor marker. Tom O'Connor from Iowa uh, is the one who had it. Mike, anything different? Well, I think you have on there. Uh, we I like using those angled, what we call Nugent forceps, which uh, help to ma manipulate the the band as we're putting it under the muscles. That to me is a uh, a real helpful uh, instrument that I use only in buckling cases. Yep, uh, same here. All right, so again, the goals, you got to find the brakes, cryo, and drain. So we're going to not go through the case, okay? So here's one of my pet peeves is opening the conjunctiva. You know, I, it, it's, I, I tend to do this myself uh, because it, I, I want to make sure the eye looks perfect at the end of surgery. Uh, and it, it's how you open is it's going to look as when you close it, right? So it's very important. Dean, uh, uh, Mike, actually, I'll go with you. Do you kind of just do a limb pyridomy? I do. There are a few principles here. What, one thing that I do is I have the fellow, you know, use whichever hand that the temporal side is, and they make one radial temporal incision, and then they go 180 degrees uh, in one direction below, and then 180 degrees above, just with that same hand. I think they have to get in mind, you know, keep in mind that the Tenons inserts about a millimeter behind where the conjunctiva inserts, and you want to cut both of those at the same time uh, to both be efficient and, and also to be uh, uh, complete with the pyridomy. Got it. Okay. And Gareth, for the relaxing incision, I don't like to do relaxings at three and or nine o'clock because you can see it postoperatively. Mm -hmm. Sometimes patients complain about the red eye a little bit more as it's healing. So I do a super temporal relaxing incision and if i need to then i do it infro nasal i do not Got it. Okay. That, that's that's i i don't do that but that's something new i learned in from you so i i, I kind of do similar but i will make uh two i'll make four little pen marks so when you want to close afterwards it's very easy for the fellows to find where the openings are 
So when you're when you've left the room and I can't stand the fellow suturing, so I, I literally have to leave because it just drives me crazy. So I kind of open and then uh, this is, but this has been helpful for them to find out where where the ends are because sometimes it is hard to see what is what. So small little trick. Um, so what about securing muscles? Again, you got to be careful about the oblique muscle. Uh, very important to approach it from the lateral rather than uh, the temporal, the, rather than the nasal side. And Mike is gonna show a case where that becomes important. And this was just recently, last week, you can, you can see the oblique here. And if that happens, you gotta release and make sure the oblique is not there. So again, this is a small point, but very important that you, you watch out for the oblique when you're doing the superior rectus. Dean, any comments on that muscle? So I think, Coming from temporal to nasal is, as you mentioned, very important. You're less likely to engage the oblique. But then after you have it hooked like you do, I slide the <laughs> instrument posteriorly. And if it hits something pretty quickly, then you assume that's the oblique. If it slides pretty far back, then you're OK. And I see that a lot because uh, it's, a, it's a common mistake. And you definitely don't want to hook the oblique. Exactly. Uh, Mike? Any quick comments? The other thing that I'll have the fellow do is they'll take an empty uh, muscle hook and they'll go anterior to the muscle hook with the, the gas hook that's got the, the sutures on it. And they're gonna hook it again, take this one out and do it over again. And I want metal on metal. So they're gonna go uh, in front of this uh, with an empty hook and then go back again in front. And usually that's just another way to ensure that they kind of release the oblique if they happen to hook it the first time. Got it. Yeah, that's a good thing to do. Uh, very good. I like that. So again, and then we kind of examine all four quadrants, uh, making sure that there's, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing anomalous, scleral thinning, make sure you kind of know. Uh, then you kind of localize breaks. And um, I don't know, Dean uh, and Mike, how you do it, but Mike, what, what do you use to localize breaks? Uh, so I'll just have the, you know, we'll just use the depressor, that O'Connor depressor, and uh, and then go with this uh, after that and lo localize that quadrant, dry it off, find that, and just I mark it with just a pen alone. I do not use any kind of uh, diathermy. Uh, I just use the the pen, and usually that's adequate. Okay, that's what I do, Dean. Anything different? Same thing. It's important not to have the pen mark. Uh, smear so you know dry it quickly with a dry cotton swab and then i always have uh this step repeated so i may do it first and then have the fellow do it to confirm that their mark is the same as mine or vice versa that's a good way to practice the uh, marking because sometimes it's hard to mark when there's fluid uh, and one thing and when I'm, go ahead mike oh i was just going to say one way to check that is that i'll take the uh the end of a cotton tip applicator and just put it on the mark and then as you push in, you just look with the indirect and you can then see what's just been marked. And that's my way of checking and making sure that the, the mark is, is in the right place. And one thing I found with the fellows to, to make the process efficient, I just have two indirects and they're switching back and forth. It's much uh, faster. So I have an indirect, they have an indirect. So we look, look back and forth. So there's no switching indirects. So I just find it to be useful. So it's cheaper to get two indirects than switching back and forth. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. I will say, you know, this, this part of the procedure does take a while, right? You have to really carefully find the breaks. You definitely don't want to miss a break. And I think it's part of the reason why buckles take so long, at least for me, because I want to make sure every break is identified and we all agree where the breaks are. And, you know, it's alluding to what you said earlier is why sometimes we don't do as many buckles. I mean, they're just, they're longer, they're more complicated. They hurt your neck. You know, you're going back and forth, putting that thing on your head and taking it off and you've got to, be sterile every time you do it and you either have baggies or new sets of gloves and it's you know it's a it's a cumbersome procedure absolutely but you know things sometimes are hard harder that you think harder are worth it and patients appreciate it yep. so this is what dean was talking about that i just like to have one mark so it's not smeared don't know where things are at and if it's multiple breaks i just mark the most posterior break right that's if there's multiple breaks so then the cryo, uh, and here's a cryo uh, that's being shown. Uh, here's uh, another uh, view of the cryo. So Dean, I'll go with you real quick. How do you sort of, uh, what do you tell the fellows about just uh, not over cryoing? Because that, it's a problem that they tend to over cryo. Yeah, cryo is a very important part of the procedure. You could miss the break, which I've seen happen. You could 
be depressing with your shaft and have the cryoprobe actually freezing something more posterior. I've seen that happen, although it didn't cryo the fovea, it cryoed you know, right outside the arcade, which was not good, but it didn't cause any problem. And you, know, you just have to really be careful. The good thing these days is these guys do a lot of cryonematics, so the fellows are actually pretty good at, at cryoing. Uh, you don't want to over cryo, like you said, so I, I test it first. I test the cryoprobe outside the eye to see how quickly it freezes. And then when the fellow's cryoing or if I'm cryoing, we, we stop the pressing the pedal as soon as you get a white reaction that surrounds the break, immediately stop. And, and Dean, uh, uh, my comment on this, this is a, a, a photograph that Dean sent uh, of an ectopic cryo. And, and this can, how do you sort of prevent this? How, and for the fellows, how do you uh, kind of make sure that they're crying the right area? Um, well, I think you asked me, I, you know, I basically say toe in, which means I want the, I want the probe angled way out. I don't want the, the, I don't want it looking like any other part of the, the cryoprobe shaft is, is pressing on the sclera. So if they're toe in is, is how I put it, but essentially, you know, I want that, that angle to be pretty severe when they're doing their depression with the cryoprobe before, so that they are only seeing the indentation of the, the tip of the probe. So and, this and, and, and this, I'm really impressed, Dean, how they got the cryo for this far back. This is impressive in itself. Yeah, that's so impressive. Well, this is not the case that, that happened to me years ago. The one I said, like I said, was outside the arcade, but still it wasn't on the break. This is one, a picture my colleague gave me, and I don't think it's her case either. I think she got it from somebody else. So these are rare, but this is, a, this is bad. You know, these are two cryo spots, both in the macula. And, uh, you know, you look at the diagram, and you see how it happens. The shaft fools you. You you think you're depressing with the tip, and you're actually depressing with the shaft. So Mike's point is great. You know whatever you want to call it. You know the tip has to be angled really far in, and uh, you have to slide it back and forth to see just that tip move and nothing else. But people uh, need to be aware of this. This is one of the worst complications. And when I'm watching the fellow do cryo, I'm I've got my head actually pretty close to the eye to make sure that that shaft is leaned away from the eye. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, these, these things might sound simple, but the three of us, we've seen and done hundreds of buckles. And, and you can kind of tell when the fellows, when the, you, if I, I worry when I don't see the shaft, I'm like, okay, what, what, what are you doing? And, and I think this is when things can happen. And here's- Rob, this, there's an important point here that um, you know, right. when, when these fellows are, are learning to do pneumatics, like Dean mentioned, and our fellow does, our fellows do a lot of pneumatics, they are inhibited by the conjunctiva. And it, the conjunctiva does not allow them to get to the macula, right? And yeah. so uh, when they're in the operating room, it's a different ball game and they need to sort of be aware of that. And um, uh, some, one of the panel, or one of the uh, attendees has asked, um, what about the technique of applying cryo just before starting the surgery? And I had never thought of that, but I think that, you know, um, the one reason I don't think that I'd be interested in doing the cryo, say, at the very beginning of the case before I've taken down the conjunctiva is then you're cryoing through the conjunctiva. And I kind of like to have more control of the eye with the muscles and not inflame the conjunctiva if I didn't have to. Uh, I don't, and I don't know what either of you think about that. I mean, I, I think, as Dean said, you, you got to be careful, but, you know, it's certainly an easy, it's a skill to learn, but I, I wouldn't want to go, you know, crying through the conjunctiva. Uh, it, it just, it's just uh, not, uh, not, you know, just for somebody, it's, it's, it's going to cause conge erosion, all kinds of issues. So, and I, then, uh, let's, go ahead, Dean. That's kind of important. Uh, as I said, you test the cryoprobe outside the eye and you see how fast it takes for the ice ball. And then you touch the eye and you do it. And as a, if a fellow is doing it and they don't see the cryo reaction really quickly, take your foot off. Because that yeah. means your tip might not be in the right place, right? Because yeah. that cryo reaction should happen fairly soon if you've tested it and it's freezing quickly. Somebody did ask a question I see about a straight shaft versus curved. And that's a good question because for years I used a straight. And then I practiced somewhere else and they gave me a curved shaft and I found the curved shaft more difficult because the thing was sliding off the eyeball because it was so angled. Maybe yeah. that's just my personal preference uh, of, for the straight because I was used to it. But what do you guys think about the straight versus the curved? So Dean, I had the same exact thing. I thought I would like the curve. I, I hated it. I saw, I went back to the straight. 
uh, and, and it, it was sliding all over. Mike, what do you think? I, I use both. And I think that the, I don't think that the straight is any more dangerous or the curved is any more beneficial. I think that the curve does have those challenges like Dean was mentioning, where you feel like you uh, don't have as much control. Uh, but I, I, I use both. I've got some ORs where they've got one and some with the other. And so, and I'm kind of adapted. Yeah, I would just say, be careful. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, we kind of talked about choice of buckles, uh, circumferential versus uh, segmental. So uh, I'm going to skip this. So one of the things now we've uh, done cryo, we've got to put our buckle on. Uh, this is a technique I don't particularly use, but my partners are very good at it here. And uh, I know some uh, around the country, this is a video I think of Kevin Blinders showing a belt loop technique. Uh, and certainly you can use that for uh, smaller bands, uh, you know, maybe 41s, uh, but, uh, you know, bigger tires, 277 tires and so on and so forth. I, it, it's hard to do that. Uh, Dean and Mike, do you guys do this technique uh, of belt loops? I, I know there are a lot of people here doing, there's some in the country who do. I do not. I use sutures. Mike, what about you? I'm, I'm the same. I think this is congenital. If you're, if you're trained to do it this way, then you're going to do it. And I, I just, I have more power to people that do that. I think that's pretty incredible. But I mean, that looks like a pretty thin sclera right there. And, you know, that's pretty awesome. But I, I don't do that. Well, yeah, that, this wasn't me. This was Kevin's video. So and every, I and every every once in a while, you know, I, I feel like I put the band on. Uh, I feel like I'd had everything marked well. I look in there and I, uh, you know, it needs to move a little bit. And with a when you use a suture, you can uncut the suture and move the band a little bit. And it's pretty easy. That would be harder. Plus, also, I like the idea of having the suture, having the buckling effect due to the suture itself and that we're a quadrant and I need it so I don't have to crank up the eye. So that's just my personal. And again, this is how we train. No right or wrong answer. So we kind of place our sutures. And this is, I think, where sometimes people turn buckles into geometry, right? They, they turn into algebraic equations. And this is, I think, what becomes difficult for fellows. Like once you mark the break, uh, Mike, I'll go with you. Do you do all these measurements and, and so on and so forth? Because I pretty much set my caliper to 13 or 14. That's where a posterior bite's going to be, whatever band or whatever I use. What about you, Mike? And now I'll go to Dean. So what I do is, you know, at the point where I've marked the break, I just put the band around the eye and I support the break. And where, where the sutures fall is where they fall. I don't measure from the limbus any distance or anything. I try to have the band, uh, I have, I try to make the band position such that it's, a, the, the break is a little toward the, the anterior part of the band. And mm -hmm. that's my only, my only goal. Dean, what about you? Are, are you, are you a geometry guy or do you just put the band on and that, that's what I do, Mike. So it sounds like uh, we, we all do it the same. I'm very scientific with marking the breaks extremely carefully. But I'm not at all scientific with throwing the band around the eye. I just put the suture in. I eyeball it. If it looks exactly. Like exactly what Mike said, I just throw the suture, posterior one first, uh, excuse me, anterior one first, and then the posterior one, and there it is. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. So let's say you, you're, they're, they're putting a suture in and there's a perforation. I mean, what, what do you do at, at that time? You know, you've got the band. Now, and it's always things when, when the fellows say, well, uh, you know, is that fluid or, and they always say it's, oh, it's goniosol. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's goniosol. That, that's fluid. So it, it, it happens. It happens to us. It happens to fellows. But what do you do? You, you see the perforation. Is, you know, talk about your steps you take at that time. So are we going to assume that this is an area of detached oh, retina? Detached retina. That's right. Detached retina. Yes. So I think if you uh, have a perf and the fluid is coming out, it's important to raise the pressure a bit in the eye, but not too much, right? You wanna prevent any bleeding that might occur, but you certainly don't wanna get retinal incarcerated in your hole. So you, you pull on the strings a little bit, not too much. Sometimes you could indent the eye right where the perf occurs with a cotton swab and you've increased the pressure a little, but not too much. That's the first thing I do. Mike, what about you? Um, you know, um, when this happens, uh, I pretty much the same. I think I, I try to put sort of, um, uh, I, 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 it depends on where in the buckle procedure this has happened. Uh, if this is like the first suture uh, of the eye, it becomes a lot more difficult uh, because now 
uh, you've got a soft eye that you're having to suture in. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to be, this is when I'm going to be looking frequently uh, intra in the eye and kind of going back and forth as I'm slowly putting on the, the in the rest of the sutures and uh, looking, you know, you may not need to drain in this case uh, because you know, the drainage may be complete just by where you've done this. Uh, you also want to make sure that if the, if the needle did injure the retina that you want to support that part of the retina and you want to make sure you're not dealing with incarceration. And I think that it's also, you know, this is the time when I'm thinking, okay, do we need to go to a, a buckle vit? Uh, because I think, you know, getting infusion in the eye can sometimes help to control things. Yeah. And, and what's, always interesting, what the, what's always interesting, Dean, is sometimes when this occurs, it's like the perfect drain. <laughs> it's like, oh. I don't know, it, it, it does happen, but the, go ahead, Dean. Yeah, that's what you hope. And it, and it does happen. Yes. So remember, if you perf into the subretinal space and fluid comes out, you really don't need to cryo it. But if you perf in an area where there's attached retina and, and the perf goes through the retina, then it's good to add a cryo spot there. All right. So, so one of the questions that came from one of the came from a, uh, somebody that's in the audience was talking about these sutures and the distance between them. And I guess we might be getting Oh, we're getting on that now. Okay, I'm sorry. So we can go. The one of the questions had to do with what happens if you have a break under a rectus muscle, and how about cryoing with a, uh, you know, either through or under the rectus muscle, and what do you guys do about that? Go, go ahead, Dean. Uh, how would you take that? So I usually, you know, lift up the the rectus muscle with a string and put the cryo probe sort of sideways and get under there. I haven't had an instance where I couldn't cryo the break because of the muscle. I must say sometimes it has been challenging, but I'll, I'll stuff it under there and push real hard and cryo it. All right, so uh, I'm going to move on uh, because we have lots more to cover. So this kind of just shows you what uh, we were talking about in terms of putting the band or tire, however you, you, you want to do it. So this becomes the next big topic is this whole issue about drainage, right? So we want to spend a few minutes, uh, uh, and for the audience, we're going to go at least to 8.30. So uh, whoever needs to leave, they can. We, we still have a bunch of stuff to uh, cover. So Dean, how do you make this decision to drain and not to drain? Just kind of go through your mindset, and then I'll ask Mike the same question. Yeah, three typical things, chronic, inferior, or bullous, I'm more likely to drain. Because I, the reason inferior, uh, you guys do something a di little different. Nick Yunuzi asked a question earlier about gas. I actually always put in a gas bubble. I put 0 0.3 cc's of C3F8. It's like a belt and suspenders. It's kind of like a pneumatic plus a buckle. Um, so therefore, uh, I always have an internal something pushing against the brake. But I, so, so if it's bullous, uh, I will drain usually. Chronic detachments I do because the fluid's thick. If it's inferior, I like to. Um, those are those are pretty much my decisions. But okay. uh, Michael, vary of course. Those aren't set in stone. But what about you? And I'll talk about also fovea on or off. If the fovea is off, I get a little more worried about draining because if it bleeds, it goes right to the fovea. If the fovea is on, I'm more likely to drain because a, a bad complication won't involve the fovea. Dean, that was my question for Mike. Damn. All right, Michael, uh, what, what, what about you besides th those things of drainage and no drainage? So I, I usually, I'm pretty big on, I want the retina all attached at the end of the case. And so I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty compulsive about getting the fluid drained and I do my drainage with a needle. And that's something that I learned from my fellowship was what we started doing needle drainage uh, when I was a fellow there at Duke. And so I'm, uh, and sometimes I'll go back you know, more than once to do new needle drainage so that I can get every, as much fluid as I can. I'm particularly interested in getting those thick inferior detachments, getting that fluid drained. And it can sometimes uh, take a while because that's really thick stuff. So I, I'm kind of similar to you guys, inferior detachments, I will drain, superior detachments, I, I may not. I'll just put a bubble in by doing multiple paracentesis because then it comes down to, as Dean said, volume, right? If you can get enough volume in the eye, I'll paracentesis once, during the first, first suture placement and paracentesis at the end. And that usually works pretty well. So yeah, what paracentesis is important. You know, you do have to have the patient leave the OR under normal pressure. And sometimes yeah. I'll sit there waiting for the AC to reform and tap again. And it's a pain in the neck. And that's why Dean doing multiple paracentesis during the case sort of, sort of uh, helps with that. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, the fellows kind of uh, talk about where to drain uh, and, uh, you know, the procedures. So I typically like to drain under a buckle, under an element, whatever I've placed, uh, typically near the horizontal uh, rectus, uh, near them, uh, and also where the retina is elevated. And I always, always look before I drain because things change during a detachment. So very important that you got to look before you drain. And uh, I'm going to have Dean and Mike talk about the kind of the different techniques for drainage um, because there's the conventional technique that Dean and Dean was nice enough to send me some uh, photographs. I've got a video. That's how I typically drain. You can do a needle drainage or Mike's got a beautiful photograph and this is not usually how it comes out. It doesn't come out <laughs> like that. So that's just a schematic. So this is sort of the, I guess, Dean, you and I are kind of old fashioned. I was at Wills, you're in Boston uh, and Duke that we kind of learned this technique of subretinal uh, of making a radial incision. Then I use a diathermy with the Myra. If you don't have the Myra, you can use- Wait, Go uh, back one slide, go back one slide. And I have, I so have- uh, There's no buckle there. I put the buckle around first, move yeah, the buckle out of the way. Exactly. But this is just, a, just to show what this looks like. Yep. So this is all done once the buckle's put on and the, the quadrant that I drain, I don't, I, I leave those sutures hanging, right? So I can move my buckle up or down depending. And uh, I, I'm going to get to Jumper's point because I know he's chomping in the bits. I know that look. So uh, here's this, uh, again, this old fashioned way. We kind of make a cut down 57 blade. Uh, the vessels don't look this big as Dean and I and Mike know. Uh, but I always diathermize. I use a Myra. We have a Myra. I got it on eBay many years ago. Uh, you can also use uh, the uh, endodiathermy for 25 or 27 gate surgery works well. And also show you there's Ed Ryan has shown beautifully using a laser uh, to, do, to do drainage as well. And then you perforate the choroid. And this is where I think the fellows always have that uh, you pray here and, and hope the retina gods are smiling and, and all goes well. And then the fluid comes out and this is the paracentesis part. So here's just uh, kind of showing it in uh, real time. Uh, here's the 57 blade as Dean, you can see the buckle is already placed but the sutures are loose. We use a diathermy and then we drain. So here's a short video that shows this. Uh, we, this we've already had, I've had the fellow cut the sclera down. Now we're diathermizing. Uh, I also have them uh, diathermized. Then we pre-place a suture to close, at least I do, to close that uh, uh, incision uh, if we need to, uh, because if there's bleeding, we wanna uh, close that incision. And we have them attempted, it, uh, didn't work. So I, then I looked in, uh, they didn't go far enough. And then uh, I, I had to do the drainage. So I always have attempt it and see what happens. They're looking, but I go inside and here's sort of the drain. Fluid comes about. And at the end, this is where the art comes in, Mike and Dean, of how much to drain, right? When do you stop? So Dean, how do you determine this? Is it just yeah, so experience? We always have a little bit of a timeout right before the drainage. So for example, if I'm draining, you know, it's different than if the fellow's draining. So let's say I'm draining and the fellow's holding the strings. The person holding the strings actually has the most important part because if there's a complication, they need to pull, as I mentioned, a little bit harder on the strings, but not too hard or you'll get incarceration. Exactly. And that's only if there's bleeding. So I, uh, I select the spot just like you did. And uh, if it comes easily, I, I put the cotton swabs in until, until it doesn't come anymore. And if I, if I see a bunch coming out, I'm happy. I don't have to drain it completely dry. I'd like to, but sometimes very little comes out. And you have to just be aware that if you did the buckle properly, you placed it right, you don't always have to drain fluid. And that's the nice thing about it. So if, if it doesn't drain, you're still okay. And it's a volume issue, right, Dean? All the time, it's a volume issue. My, Mike, any comments? I'm going to get to your video next. Yeah, Mike does a yeah, different so, thing. This is really nice. Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't done a scleral cut down in my, in 25 years. And so um, all I do are needle drainage cases. And so what, the way I do it is I place the band, I tighten it um, completely tight so that the pressure is very high. And then I slide a 25 gauge needle bevel away into the area where uh, I want to do the drainage. I've got an indirect on, I can see the indentation of my needle. I direct it, it's gonna be really where the buckle is. I in, in direct it under the retina in that area. I've got an open TV syringe typically, and I just watch that fluid flutter toward the break uh, or towards the drainage site. And typically you can watch it in the video I show, shows this, the, 
the, the retina then drapes around the needle and you withdraw the needle. And if in a perfect situation, I've, I've tightened the buckle enough that it's a good indentation and the pressure is back to normal after doing the drainage. And it's, it's pretty slick when it works. So, and, and it seems to work a lot of the time. And I've, if you do have bleeding, uh, I try to do this inferonasal is the, the best place to drain. Uh, and if I do get bleeding, I know immediately and I'm putting pressure on and I feel like it's a, it's a, you know, there's not a chance, there's not as big a risk of incarceration when you have a smaller opening uh, in the choroid. Got it. Yeah, Mike, so the concern is always as it's, as the retina is draping over the needle, it'll make a hole in the retina. Is that concern legitimate? Does it have any no. merit or does it never happen? Well, even if you make a hole, it's on the buckle. And, you know, it's a funny thing. We make, I think that holes can be made in the retina with when there's not bad traction and it's not a big problem. But that has not been an issue. And I have made holes in the retina. And if it's on the buckle where I'm by design putting the needle in, I don't, I don't do anything. I don't treat it. Uh, it's not a big tear. It's usually a little hole in the retina that you see. And that's not ever, that's not been an issue for me. I, I, so I think this just goes to show you, Dean and I do this, this way, Mike does it his way. Whatever way you find, you, you just try to make it in a way that you feel comfortable doing it. Because for a lot of the fellows, this is the step that there's trepidation about of how to do it and when to do it. And also what to do after this occurs. At least I think this is, this is kind of that moment when they know that they can buckle. Uh, in terms of drainage or not. Okay, we have a, we have a question. Um, someone asked, I've been told before the stab needle drains that have higher risk of bleeding, but the cut downs have higher risk of incarceration. Do you guys uh, believe that? Uh, no. I've had some incarceration with the cut down that I do. So I would agree that that, that can occur. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it happens if the person's pulling on the string too much. I was gonna say, Dean, that's the reason, right? That, What's that? Pulling, on, pulling on the strings, that's the reason, right? You got, you got to like that. Too hard. Mike, have you seen bleeding with the stab method? With just the needle drainage that I do? Yes, I've seen it. And, and I feel like uh, it has not been a big problem because once you see it, you put a lot of pressure on the eye and you can sort of stop that bleeding. And so that's a, it's five or 10 minutes of you kind of putting pressure on the eye and making sure that that bleeding stops. But I've not seen uncontrolled bleeding in a case like that. All right, Mike, this is a beautiful video. So let's go through it quickly. So this is just the kind of chandelier assisted uh, bu buckle case. So you can see uh, with a, a, this is a superior tear, it's kind of inverted, but I'm uh, showing the cryo of the anterior flap and then uh, another cryo of, the, of a, a, another tear. So we got two tears here. Um, now I'm placing the buckle and this is me using 5.0 nylon. And I tend to like to get those uh, nylon knots off of the buckle posteriorly. And this is the actual drainage. So the needle is underneath the retina in the quadrant where the greatest bullous detachment and all that fluid flows towards there. And you can see as it starts going down, it's a little pixelated, but as you can see, it starts going down. Uh, the, the needle started right there. You can just, as you see the needle, uh, the retina drain over the drape over the needle, you can start pulling that out. And that's usually a pretty complete drainage. Very nice, very nice. So here, I just wanted for completeness, if you don't have these tips, you can also use a laser, but that's another 120 bucks laser uh, and laser the choroid, uh, make a chorodotomy uh, with it. So this has been reported. Ed Ryan actually wrote about this uh, first. So Wait, here's a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Mike, you want to address the longer question, the following one that's short, prior to needle drain, the buckle is fully tied. As we said, yeah, we put those, uh, Temporary sutures. We don't tie the buckle until the drainage is done. And then, Mike, you can address the longer question about this little holder that prevents the needle from going in too far. That looks pretty slick. Yes. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of uh, techniques that you can find. In fact, I think that there is a device that now is commercially available for helping with the needle tech needle drainage technique. Uh, and I haven't I don't have any experience with it. But uh, prior to the needle drain is the, and for my cases, when I'm doing needle drainage, I have, the buckle is totally on, totally sewn in place and tightened. So it's all done. Uh, I haven't trimmed the edges of the buckle, but I've done everything and then I drain. Uh, and then, um, uh, but there are, there are techniques that you can do to try to 
decrease the, the risk of going deep with the, the needle. Uh, what, I, what I envision, and I think with this product that is available would be a, sort of a scleral depressor that then you could place a needle down and insert the needle through the end of the depressor so that you can get a couple millimeters of, uh, of, of travel of the needle and no more and then drain that way and even potentially have lighting of that device so that you could really see well. And I think that that would make needle drainage a little bit more uh, user-friendly. A guarded, guarded, lighted needle, Mike. That's what we need. Yeah. So let the, this is what happens. Let's say you drain, perfect drain. Dean's having coffee, everything's going. So we, uh, we used to call that at Wills an APB. Bill Benson taught this, another perfect buckle, right? You go home. That doesn't always occur. So Dean already talked about this, no fluid. What do you do, right? Uh, if there's no fluid, Dean, I tend to look and make sure what's going on in the eye. Has the fluid shifted or what? You, you do anything differently? No, I take a look and uh, that's it. You know, I, I may <laughs> stick the needle back in if there's still fluid and it, maybe it just got clogged for some reason, but that's about it. Michael, what happens like this when the fellows say, well, it drains. When you look, the eye's soft, but the same amount of fluid. What's, what do you think is going on here? Well, I think that, you know, a lot of these eyes are very high myopes. They've got very liquefied vitreous and it's possible that you can, you know, get a lot of fluid out of the eye that's not necessarily subretinal fluid. Sometimes the vitreous and the liquefied vitreous is thinner than the actual subretinal fluid in a chronic detachment case. So maybe that's it. And you're kind of pumping it through the break. And that's why it's important to choose your drain site carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, hemorrhage, uh, Dean, what do you do if you have a hemorrhage? How do you make that decision? What to do next? Uh, just pull up on the pressure a little bit, but not too high. Uh, at this, if it's you know, if it's pouring out blood, which is extraordinarily rare, you know, then the person should pull pretty hard and not worry about incarceration because you really got to stop a massive hemorrhage. But if it's just a little ooze, you can just pull a little harder on the strings, and that's about it. But stop manipulating the eye and get out of there before it bleeds. Badly. So that goes back to one of Dean's very important points. If it's a macula off detachment, if you get a hemorrhage, then you will get hemorrhage typically into the fovea. So you gotta be careful on those patients. I think that's one of the reasons Dean mentioned uh, whether it's macula on or off. Uh, retinal incarceration, uh, certainly that can occur. And we kind of talked about that too much drainage, right? And that's why I always keep a TB with air ready or gas before I drain. Because that's not the time to ask the nurse, get me some SF6 or get me some plain air. It becomes a matter of panic for these people. So. If the nurses, you should never panic, but if they think you're panicked, they're gonna be panicking. So don't do that. And this is a beautiful photograph Dean sent of a retinal incarceration. So uh, typically, uh, Dean, you cryo these. If you get incarcerated, what do you do? Yes, I cryo these, uh, yes. And you know, what you often find post-op is it looks like this intra-op and then on post-op day one, there's actually a little hole there because the thing has pulled away, especially if you use a gas bubble, it's more likely to, push down on it and, and cause the uh, incarceration to actually rip. So you're, you're really happy that you put a cryo spot there because the, there could be a bigger hole on post-op day one. Got it. You don't okay. see any hole here. All right, so we're gonna kind of, we, we talked about, uh, um, this is another thing. You, 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 you wanna tighten these buckles, but sometimes this is what you see, right? A pretty tight and high buckle. And one of the things I always tell the fellows early on in their career, they're going to have tighter buckles, whatever they do. You know, they think sometimes tighter just means better. And if, if for me, the rule of thumb is if I see a lot of buckling effect outside the eye on the buckle, it's too tight. You used to just see a bare buckling effect on the outside. Mike, any comments? I tend to, I, I asked the fellow to look in a quadrant away from where the detachment was to see about the height there. If they look like the height's pretty good there and not too high, then it's probably gonna be good on the, uh, where the detachment was. Uh, but kind of looking all around and looking for the buckle height. Yeah, you, you don't wanna to be too high on that. I mean, that's when you get into really big myopic shifts and that's where your anterior segment colleagues are uh, you know, upset with you and all that. But you know, the main goal, we're in the anatomy business and you wanna get that retina attached. You know what I don't like when you look, let's say nasally and the buckle's low and you look temporally and it's too high, right? In one place, it's too low, the other too yeah. high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it should look uniform, right, Dean? And it, it, it should look like this, right? It's uniform, 360 degrees. So, 
All right. So also very important. I know this is uh, retina, but make sure if you take an epithelium off, make sure that they've not had LASIK. You can have flaps that come off. So be very careful in these high myopes. They've had LASIK surgery. So don't do that. Okay. So uh, another one of my pet peeves, same thing Mike and Dean and I talked about, make sure the conge looks good at the end, right? The conge, it, you gotta, you gotta make sure this looks good at the end because this is what patients notice. And it just, I'm you conjunctiva over the cornea. Mike? There's an attendee question about having, have, have any of us seen anterior segment ischemia from tight buckles? I have not. I have not. I've seen some patients that had pain and maybe it was from the tight buckle, not sure. So I, already, I have not either. We already kind of talked about all this. So uh, th this is an interesting guy, uh, 60. Uh, so 68 year old gentleman, phakic, had a PVD, uh, had a buckle and cryo. Uh, and this is what he looked like. And I, I wish all of them would look like this post-op week one. Because one of the things that people uh, have a hard time is how do you follow patients you've not drained? I didn't drain him. I put a small bubble in at the end and he was doing fine post-op uh, week one and post-op uh, month two, 2040 doing well. But here's a patient who's interesting. 49 year old has a PVD fakia, uh, did a buckle on her. And this is interesting. This is the, here's the detachment. Here's a break uh, right here. And she had a detachment in the other eye as well. Okay, so she came with bilateral detachment. So Dean, this is always a question. I drained her and this is what she looked like post-op day one. There's a small bubble. Here's some fluid. The break is just about closed. How do you make this decision of following fluid? Because the fellow who saw said, boy, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. You know, there's still some fluid. I, I'll go with you first, Dean, and then Mike, because this is always becomes a judgment call. So this is why I do like to put in gas, as I said, 0.3 cc's of C3F8, which expands pretty much because I never know when I'm going to need it. And here's a case where it looks like you might need it. You don't know. It's possible you could leave it alone and it's just going to get better. But I would rather have the patient be face down. And I even tell them to hang off the bed and, you know, put their forehead a little lower than their chin. <laughs> Not quite hanging from your feet, but it's the next best thing. And uh, these go away. So I use the bubble to my advantage when I need to. And the bubble here was done for volume because of drainage, but uh, I'll show you what happens. So this is post-op day one. I like to get photographs on every post-op day just to explain to the patient and follow. And this is what she looked post-op week two, 2040, fluids gone, breaks perfectly in the buckle and she has a 277 tire right here. And she had thin sclera uh, other places. But Mike, this is always the issue with, with when people are new in practice how do you follow the fluid? Does it just take experience or you just, again, as Dean said, follow the principle? Yeah, I mean, I feel like if, you know, if, if you feel like the break is well supported and you feel like uh, the, there's not any fluid really anterior to the buckle or, you know, a lot of fluid on the buckle, then I think most of the time you're going you're, you're gonna to do well. And, uh, you know, in this situation, I would have done exactly as Dean did and use that bubble to uh, make sure that 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 fluid uh, kind of, uh, you give the best chance of getting that fluid and getting that buckle uh, uh, to work. But yeah, I think that most of the time, uh, if you've got the buckle in the right place, it's gonna, it's gonna do well, but it's a little bit disconcerting to see fluid, even posterior to the buckle, you know, that can be there for sometimes a long time. Uh, you just have to be, uh, you gotta be, uh, stick with the principles and it usually works out. And that's what we did here. Here's another patient, uh, uh, retinal detachment, uh, chronic detachment has, now I, I like to use infrared photographs because here's Dean's bubble and you can see the fluid posterior to the buckle, okay? And, but over time, uh, the fluid goes away, goes away and patient does well. So I, I find infrared photographs to be really useful to follow fluid posterior to the buckle. I don't know, Dean, if you've done that, but it's, it's, it's very useful to see, see them. Yeah, I have not done that. That's clever. Sometimes um, autofluorescence shows it. Exactly. But, uh, it is, infrared looks better. It's really nice. So I'll show you another case. This is a nurse who had a detachment, again, bilateral detachments, uh, a series of bilateral detachments. She had a detachment, 28 year old, 2040, with a buckle. Uh, there's the detachment. She had multiple areas of lattice. Uh, and here's the bubble. You can see the cryo. 
fluids going away, going away at 2070, but she still has this pocket of fluid post-op month two. And I just recently saw her, it's pretty much just about gone. You can see the pre-op, post-op day one, week two, month two. You can see this chronic little fluid in the posterior pole uh, there, and that will be gone. I've seen this, and she's very happy with their vision. So, uh, Dean, any advice or Mike, any advice for the fellows to, you know, when you intervene in these patients? Mike, I'll go with you first. Yeah, Mike said it well, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like uh, this is one of those that, you know, especially in the, if the fovea is attached and there's temporal fluid, then you can go, you can go 18 months and there still might be some fluid there, but it usually goes away over time. And you have to, you have to be confident uh, and you have to, you know, in, that you don't, you aren't missing a break and you have to be reassuring to the patient and uh, most of the time, you know, it's just going to slowly go away over time. And there's not really any good reason to, to intervene unless you, uh, unless the mac the fovea is detached. Got it. So one real quick case, and then we got some other stuff. 68 year old guy who had a capsular issues, and that's why we did a buckle on him. 2050 buckle and cryo. But just to note that when you position patients, and Dean and Mike have seen this, you'll get shifting of fluid. So post op day one, you'll see, think, oh my God, he's worse, right? You got more fluid over here. The, you got a bubble, retina is attached. This is post-op day one, post-op day three, fluid's gone, right? So you gotta be patient with this, that when you position patients and Dean is shaking his head, you will get displacement of fluid, uh, either temporary or nasally, that you gotta be careful. Dean, any comments? No, nothing to add. Okay. So. How do you prevent this? You see them the next day, and now you, the bubble you put in is subretinal. Well, C3F8, Dean. It probably was a fish egg when you put it in. Exactly. So how do you prevent that? How do you prevent fish eggs? I think most people know because they do a lot of pneumatics these days. You know, you, you put the needle in, and then you pull the needle back, and it helps if somebody else is looking to see that the tip is just barely in the eye. Uh, you could also do it. Uh, where you're injecting into your gas bubble at the highest point, the patient's on their side, you do it temporally. So you're injecting into your bubble and you get one large bubble with the needle not too far in the eye. Mike, any West Coast tips for uh, uh, bubbles? Um, I mean, I, same things. You know, um, sometimes uh, uh, we'll give a little gentle thump to the eye to try to turn the fish eggs into a, more of a, a larger bubble. But um, I tend to try to, inject into the bubble. The, the downside of that is that you can sometimes inject into that uh, Wiegert's ligament area and kind of right behind the lens and get sort of a sausage of the, of the gas bubble uh, behind the lens and not really in the vitreous cavity if you're a little too anterior towards the limbus or a little too shallow. So I, you try to kind of uh, walk that tightrope. Okay. So Gara, you know, I don't, I don't think this is in the slide deck, but you know, fish mouthing, when you put on a band and yes. the, the large break opens up, there's three ways to get rid of that. You lower the band or you add a gas bubble or you put on a, a radial element like a sponge. And I was that the bubble is the easiest thing to add, right, Dean? The easiest. And one thing about bubbles, another one, pet peeves, I always make sure they drop the gas or I drop the gas right before I want to put it in. If it's drawn up too far ahead in time, the gas might leak out of the syringe. You might not get what you're looking for. So very important, at least uh, uh, to make sure the gas is either drawn up by you yourself, but right before you want to put it in. You don't want it to be sitting uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on the table. Uh, Gaurav, a couple questions from attendees. And um, one is, uh, do you think that uh, doing a buckle alone gives you less sort of macular translocation or uh, metamorphopsia than doing a vitrectomy or a vit buckle? Uh, Dean, take that one real quick. I think it depends on the amount of subretinal fluid remaining. So if you get a really good drainage, I do think you're gonna have less metamorphopsia and less translocation. If your drainage is terrible, uh, you may have a problem, right? Pneumatics have the worst because you don't drain at all. And, and vit is somewhat in, intermediate between the two. It, it's funny as that question comes up, here's a bullous detachment. But well, I'm gonna argue that, I'm gonna argue something about that, you know, because when you're doing a pneumatic, you're not changing the surface area of the choroid. Um, and so I don't know that you, you can say that you're getting more metamorphopsia when you're doing a pneumatic than if you're doing something that, you know, changes the shape of the eye such that the retina is 
coming back to a place that it's kind of been changed around than before. So I, I'm not sure that the that the metamorphopsia issue is as big and pneumatic as you're suggesting. I, I think you're right. I think uh, it's related to to probably the amount of subretinal fluid plus some other factors like manipulating the uh, contour of the eye. I think you're right. So, so, so I, I think Mike Rajiv Muni has shown beautifully with with looking at vessels uh, on photographs that that there is less of this torsion in pneumatics. I I, I think that mm -hmm. there's probably some truth to that, but. Speaking of that, perfect time question. Here's a bullous detachment, undergoes a buckle. They didn't really position as good as we wanted them to overnight. And then they come the next day and I see this. Dean, what's going on here? So you have to distinguish outer retinal folds from full thickness folds. Outer folds go away, full thickness don't. This looks like it's probably an outer retinal fold, uh, both on the uh, infrared and on the OCT. It's nice to, to, to scroll uh, with the OCT scanner uh, on a volume scan, and it, they look like jumping fish on the deep redness. This is probably an outer fold, so it's probably going to go away. Exactly, and that's exactly what happened, Dean. She, they ended up doing fine. But in contrast to this, right? So, so this thick. doesn't go away, right? That's a full and, thickness dry fold, right? The two yeah, edges right. are stuck together. There's no fluid between them. Exactly, and that's why it's very important if you do position these patients uh, afterwards, whatever way you do positioning, document it, document it, document it uh, on that. And these are similar folds, Dean. Uh, these, are, these are not good folds to have, okay? Uh, this happened uh, post-buckle, but again, this went away uh, over time, a choroidal uh, hemorrhage. Uh, this so what, what band, what element was that on that last one? Th this one, what Mike? In that case, yeah, what, what element did you put around? Uh, this is actually, this is not one of my cases. Uh, oh, okay. This is somebody else. Uh, they put a 4050 band. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so years ago, we saw this more commonly when we used a lot of big bands, right? Yeah. Back in the day when we were fellows, it was common to put these very large bands on the eye. We saw choroidals quite commonly because we were impeding vortex vein drainage and we put the buckle on a little higher. These days, you know, we're using smaller bands. We don't pull it as tight. And it is really rare that you get the choroidals. And this was a patient on anticoagulation, right? So that was a problem. Uh, this is just a failed bu buckle that was sent to me one week after buckle surgery. This patient needed a vitrectomy. So buckles will fail, right? It, it, it's just like any surgery. They will have a problem and you need to deal with them. So here's a patient who has this detachment. We buckle it. Patient does well. Here's the autofluorescence, and Dean already knows, and Mike, this is what happens. So Dean has written a paper on this. Uh, Dean, tell us about this. It's just a slowly resorbing subretinal fluid. I think everybody's familiar with this, especially when you see little blebs like this on the OCT. Can happen after any procedure where you leave fluid or even you think you didn't leave fluid. And we actually found it was related to choroidal thickness. So if you had a thick choroid, you were more likely to get this. But there were still patients who had thin choroids that got this. And the, the moral of the story is don't do anything, it'll go away as long as you don't have an open break. Getting back to what Mike said earlier, which is the most important part of this whole presentation. If you did it right, you found the breaks, you marked them, they're closed, just, just it's gonna work. Follow so, the process, Dean. We, we've heard that too often these last three weeks, follow the process. <laughs> what I wouldn't do in this situation is give the patient steroids. Because if yeah. they have a thick cord and they're prone to this, you might actually make this worse. My, this is a case from Mike showing similar findings. So let's talk a little bit about post-operative complications. Uh, Dean, I'm going to kind of flip through these slides. Uh, you were kind enough to send these. Uh, con cyst, how do you prevent this, Dean, besides well, good con closure? Meticulous conjunctival closure. This should okay. never happen. Okay, okay. This Subcon flashes should not occur. Horrible. horrible. Endophthalmitis. Did you soak your buckles? I do Mike. not because they're not porous, so I don't soak them. I did years ago, but then I realized, uh, what am I doing? This doesn't absorb any antibiotic. Same thing as, as Dean. Mike, what about you? We put it, yeah, there's kind of the this, this sort of the standard around everybody soaks their buckles, but I, I'm a believer with Dean. And okay. if you do soak it, do not soak it in an amino glycoside. People used to soak these things in gent. You don't want gent anywhere near the eye. Nope. Uh, here's a suture problem. You see this post-operatively, should have looked. What do you do? Probably nothing. 
All right, good. But again, that's important to look when you put sutures at the end to make sure, because it's more embarrassing as well, right? You, you, you see this and, and, and just shouldn't occur. But if you Here's pull it out, right, it could bleed, right? What do you, so what do you do? Do you just leave it? I, I leave it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's an intrusion, extrusion. Well, if I if I see that, if I see a subretinal suture at the time of surgery, I will go to that quadrant. I will place a suture on either, you know, I'll, I'll try to support that area and I'll move the buckle to the side where the suture was. And then I'll remove that suture is what I tend to do in those cases. So Mike, I did the exact same thing. It's not like we have hundreds of these, but yes, that, that, that will occur. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there might just be a small amount of drainage you don't see, right? And you look and go, oh, that's a suture uh, and you got to fix it. So this is Kevin was nice and to send me this buckle removal video. We have one of Mike's coming up as well. And then a few minutes and we'll be done. So here's a buckle, uh, a sponge that had to be removed. Uh, I think he ended up putting this uh, 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 suture for traction uh, because uh, again, hard to manipulate these eyes. Uh, with a buckle already on there. So this was an exposed sponge uh, along with an exposed buckle. And uh, the sutures then put in, uh, eyes rotated. And uh, it, it, these buckle removals are harder than you think. And uh, many, many years ago, one of my partners about 15 years ago tried to do it in the office and there was a loud scream from next door. The, you, you, it, it's not easy, just pull, pull on these things, okay? So this one, the sponge comes out pretty easily, uh, but then they take the, cut the band. Uh, Dean, you, as this video is playing, you have any advice removing sponges or buckles or uh, go with you first and then Mike? Exactly what you said. Don't ever do this in the clinic. I saw that when I was a fellow once and the patient screamed bloody murder. So don't, yeah. don't do it. Mike, what about you? Uh, same thing. These are, these are much more complex than you think you end up doing. This is, this is going very smoothly, but a lot of times you end up having to do a lot more dissecting than you think. A lot of times these are going to be, I'll do them under general uh, as opposed to local Mac, because most of the time these eyes are very inflamed and irritated if you're going to the length of taking the buckle out. So yeah, I, uh, what you just said, I, I echo it. So I have a question for you guys. If, if you have a Dean, real quick, do you just take part of a buckle, Mike, if you can't get it out? No. no I try to get the whole thing. Okay, Dean, go ahead. So let's say you have a, a buckle that was put in 10 years ago and the patient comes in and they have some conjunctival erosion, a little hole in their conj, and the buckle is infected and you want to take it out. Do you close the conj or do you leave it open? I irrigate it. I, I, sometimes, it, Dean, it's hard to close the conj in those patients because it's all foreshortened. So I, I, I try to dissect a little bit of it, but I do tend to close it if I can, but sometimes it's difficult because it's just so scarred down and it's like Swiss cheese. But is there, let's say you could close it, you know, would you, or do you want to keep that uh, pocket that has pus in it, like exposed to the external yeah, environment? I don't know the answer, I'm just asking. I, I don't know, I, I, I take the buckle out and I, I try to see if I can close it because I also don't want things to go in either. They can go both ways. Mike? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I was looking at the, I was looking at comments and Ivan Sr. makes a good point is that, you know, I always put the, the sleeve in a quadrant in the kind of by convention, I put the sleeve in the superior nasal quadrant. And that way I know when I'm taking the buckle out, I, I'm, I'm, I kind of try to get to the sleeve to remove the sleeve because it's easier to remove from the sleeve than to try to get the sleeve under muscles and through sutures. So uh, he put it, he made a good point of that. Well, and I, I then asked. That. Yep, I did the same thing. I, I always put it typically at the same place unless there's an issue. Dean, what about you when you put same your sleeve? Thing. Always super nasal and that's how I take it out, same place. Um, all right, uh, we're getting near the end. So motility, uh, certainly an issue. Mike, here's a case of yours. Go through it real quick. So this is another a patient that we've talked about isolating muscles and being sure that you got the, the right muscle. Well, this is a patient who had a buckle bit and and uh, he complained perfectly that, you know, his right eye image is tilted and diagonal to the left eye image. And it's better if he tilts his head back and to the right. And you could tell he had sort of restriction of superduction, but he still had an inferior RD. So this video you'll see kind of shows us dealing with this, uh, this buckle. And what has happened is I've hooked the superior rectus. And you can see that's not around the element that's uh, the muscle that's under the buckle. So I'm removing the buckle the buckle is under the superior oblique. So the oblique was what was isolated and used and the, and the, uh, the band was put under and the, the 
now I'm kind of separating the oblique from the, the superior rectus muscle. And you can see that's the, that's the superior rectus and there's the oblique. And, uh, you know, it's never going to be the same again, but I did not want to uh, go back there and do any more manipulating in that part of the eye. The detachment was inferior. So I put a circumferential oval shaped six millimeter sponge inferiorly and got the retina reattached. And Mike, this is one of the things that we all three talked about, right? Simple things, right? I initially, simple things, making sure you don't have the oblique muscle. And sure, you can do all these things, but the patient is never going to be the same, unfortunately, uh, for symptoms. So um, I think, and again, there's a misconception about all this stuff about diplopia. We, we wrote this up at the Academy in 2010. It's pretty rare for migration and removal. So whoever tells you it happens all the time, not necessarily true. So we've, we've already, already kind of talked about these principles. Uh, certainly consider buckles. Uh, buckles have worked for 65 years. They continue to work. And really, I think important for the fellows, do the procedure in your hands that's best that you can do. You know, just because somebody says in the podium doesn't mean it's correct. They can, they're often wrong. Uh, and I think that, uh, especially in large practices, if your partner says, well, you should do this, you should do this. Well, that's fine. Then they, he or she can do it because they're not going to be the ones seeing them for post-operative care. And it's you should do what you feel comfortable doing in, in your hands. So last bit of uh, uh, advice, Dean, uh, I'll start with you first for these guys. I guess I would say kind of what you just said, find out what you're comfortable with and just do whatever's best in your hands. You know, we all do things differently. That's the beauty of retina, right? That's why we didn't go into cataract surgery because every case is different. Every doctor does it a little differently and just find out uh, what you are comfortable with. Mike, what about you? Well, uh, for the fellows that are uh, listening on, you know, I think it's important that they have experience doing straight buckles. And so, you know, a lot of times the attending is open to doing that as an option. And if patients present themselves that are a good candidate, I would, you know, kind of encourage your attending to consider that so that you have some experience before you leave your fellowship. And, you know, I think that uh, using a chandelier buckle uh, technique, which has been written up and there are, there are reports on that is a good way to learn. And that's another thing that you can uh, consider doing with your attending. And I think most attendings would be open to trying these things. Yeah, I, and I, I kind of echo both those points. Uh, also for the fellows, keep doing buckles, right? When you first begin, keep doing it because the more you do of them, you know, all three of us have done hundreds, hundreds of buckles, both in training and in, in practice. The more you do, the more comfortable you will be. But in the first couple of years, if you stop doing them, it's, it's gonna be a slippery slope. And the world is becoming more myopic. There's going to be more phacic detachment. Uh, and only you're going to be able to fix it. It won't be optometry. There's no co-management here with retinal detachment. So it's going to be up to you. So I would say keep doing it. And, you know, you will have failures, but that's okay. Uh, there, you know, you, you can learn from those, but keep doing it. Uh, again, this is one of my patients who, who's a big billion buckle. She's a physician's wife who's done very well with buckles in both eyes. And uh, she was kind enough to put this for the non-believers out there. So I know we ran about 10 minutes over. Uh, I wanna thank Dean and Mike. We've always been a team and really good friends and I appreciate their time to, uh, uh, to put this together uh, and their effort. I, I wanna thank James uh, from Dork uh, and uh, 115 people are still out there uh, listening because I guess this must be fascinating news about buckles, uh, but I think this is important. Uh, so appreciate your time. James, any last words? Uh, for the audience out there? No, no, just just thank you to, to you, Gaurav, um, and yeah, equally to, to Mike and Dean. Uh, I mean, not just for for all of the the, the work you've done in the run-up to this event, but, but for keeping the event so engaging with all of the discussion around every single case. Uh, and that's that's shown by the, the people who've stayed online and the, and the questions that we've had come through. So uh, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a really great educational event and um, some great cases in there. So, so thanks to all of you and thanks to all of the attendees. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you from the East Coast, Midwest and West Coast. This is the buckles of America. Make the retina great again. I guess that's, that's, that's the motto. That, that's what we want. So, thanks to uh, Rob for putting this together. You did a lot of work. That was really, really uh, well done. Yep, no problem. Thank you very much. James, thank you. You guys have a good night. Yeah. Thanks so much. Good night.